Hi, today we are very happy to have uh, Mr. Peter Walk to, to join us to have a conversation and dialogue about uh, lots of uh, issues. And uh, so now let me uh, give uh, Peter the chance to introduce uh, himself about his uh, work experience and his background. Let me just start with my uh, interest in China, which has been pretty high for probably 40 years. So I studied biographies of a lot of my favorite people, so composers, authors, etc. So I got to develop a better understanding of the East versus the West. Uh -huh. I think Western uh, philosophies and religions are what I would call dualistic by nature. Hmm, so so okay. they're inherently judgmental. So you have good, bad, mm -hmm. heaven, hell, etc. Is that mostly influenced by this uh, Christianity? Yes, very okay. influenced by Judeo, uh, Jewish, okay. and Christian faith. Okay. Uh, and, and I just didn't find that very appealing. I, I don't like the idea that people are constantly looking for winners and losers mm -hmm. and uh, so when I started the Eastern religions, and I started with Buddhism and Hinduism, okay. I like very much the idea of harmony and balance. Mm -hmm. So I just said, I'm okay. just basically an Easterner in a Western body. When I hit 60, I told my assistant I wanted to go to China every six oh, okay. to eight weeks for a week. So when was that? Which uh, that started probably 15 years ago. Okay. But I made over 80 trips to China okay. Okay. because my field at, at McKinsey was insurance. So okay. I was advising okay. large insurance companies around okay. the world. So around the early 2000. So that yes. was your first trip to China. Yeah, first trips. And, uh, well, I did some earlier trips when China was all bicycles, no cars. Oh, in the 80s? Or? Yes, in okay. the 80s okay. and, and early 90s. But this was the first time I really spent dedicated time in China. And I wound up writing a book because I got so tired of reading in the Western press mm -hmm. about the oppressive, corrupt government mm -hmm. and the unhappy, okay. oppressed people. Okay. And I said to myself, I've made over 80 trips. How come I've never met any hmm. of these unhappy, oppressed people? Okay, but you, you travel to both the cities and the rural areas? Yeah, but I'd say probably 75% would have been big cities. Big cities, okay. Uh, most of the other time, I was here for pleasure with my family, with okay. my kids, and uh, okay, yeah. So, but I, I developed a pretty good feel for China overall. So, uh, I, I wrote a book that largely uh, examines the real differences between the U.S. and China because the U.S. is always saying our model is the only right model that ultimately everyone is going to become a democracy. By the way, I don't believe that at all. Yeah. So the U.S. is an individualistic model mm -hmm. going back to escaping Europe. China is very much a collective mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. uh, U.S. has a relatively, they don't like to hear these words, a relatively weak government by design. Mm -hmm. So when the founding fathers start to develop the constitution in the mm -hmm. U.S., mm -hmm. they basically said, let's do everything we can to minimize mm -hmm. what the government is allowed to do mm -hmm. because this is, should be a country of, by, and for the people. Okay. Um, and China, on the other hand, had a very strong central government, has going back thousands of years. It's always had that. In part, I think, because people need to come together to protect against the evasions from the north. And then also the number of catastrophes, weather catastrophes, mm -hmm. that required people to come together to kind of rebuild. So the model was very much... So the U.S. seems to have a natural, uh, national border, so it's much safer. Yes, to totally. China totally. Yeah, we Indonesia. had no equivalents. I mean, right. when settlers arrived in, India, uh, uh, in the U.S., the country was basically owned by Indians. Yeah who were relatively unsophisticated okay. in the U.S. in a not very nice way, basically. But, but it seems the, the, the U.S. president, you know, in the time of emergency, for example, perhaps also has a, a lot of power. Yes. And, and the Congress can also, you know, set up new laws to overrule, yes. you know, the old, old ones right. in, in a time of emergency, maybe. So yeah. that makes uh, uh, the U.S. quite flexible. Yes. Dealing with crisis and also during peaceful time, maybe yeah. governments try to minimize the yeah. size. Yeah, but but there is a, a, one very significant difference is the best and the brightest young people in the U.S. Mm 
almost always go into business. Go to business. They do uh, not also, go into uh, government. Uh, they go view to, go as go the to government. Law and, and, and the yes. medi medical field. Yeah. Because that's where you make most of them. Make a lot of money. Make a lot. Make a lot of money. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And the best and the brightest, going back to the Mandarin tradition in China, generally went into public service and government. Right, right, yes. But the net effect is, you know, if I think about the people I've met in the Chinese government, they are highly educated, they tend to be pretty worldly and have had jobs in, in different have sectors. You, have you, but how would you compare this kind of U.S. system with European countries? Because, you know, the, the whole process we call you know, uh, so-called modern civilization, whether that be scientific revolution or industrial revolution, they actually started in Europe. And but how the European yes. countries' political system differ from the US, yeah. or they're similar? They're similar in the sense that they're both democracies. Mm -hmm. So you rely on votes to select your leaders. But their democracy come uh, much later, right? Starting in the 18th century, 19th century, none of the European country was a democrat. Yeah. Was, well, had a democracy. Right? Yeah. It was under monarchy mostly. Yeah, but, and, and you also had, Europe was a very deeply ingrained class system, mm. whereas the U.S. from the very beginning was not a class system. I mean, right, right. the purpose was equal opportunity for everyone because they were escaping Europe, right. which was a class system. Right, right. Um, but right. I, th I think the economies evolved in, in fairly similar ways. The di I think the difference in the U.S., is the U.S. relied very much on immigration I for creativity. Yes. So a lot right. of the great inventions, right. discoveries, yes. that came out of America really can tr be traced back to Europeans okay. who emigrated to the United States okay. frequently because they wanted to escape oppression. Okay. In, Seems in so, uh, from the Chinese point of view, you know, when, when I talk to lots of Chinese, whether they are from different background, when they talk about the U.S., it seems they have they have a much bigger uh, picture in their mind. Is they talk about the West, and uh, they know that uh, the rise of the West started in Europe. So therefore, they like to compare what's the major difference between Europe and China. Then starting from there, they try to then they next they move to what's the major difference between U.S. and China. Yeah. So therefore, I would have to know from your point of view, you know, if you compare Europe with China and compare Europe with the U.S. What kind of, you know, major difference in terms of whether that be political system or institutions or some other background you, you see? You, the contrast between the U.S. and China seems much striking larger. Yes. But if you compare Europe and China, especially in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century when Europe rose up, maybe the difference was different, or different type of difference. How would you see that? Well, I mean, I mean, obviously, there wasn't that much interaction between the Europeans and China until the Opium Wars in the 19th century. Right. And I think, especially Great Britain, which kind of took the lead, yeah. I think that created a, a pretty high level of tension mm -hmm. between China and right, the Europeans. Right. right. I think the Americans played a role in the Opium Wars, but it wasn't a dramatic role. Right. And I think the, uh, I'd say the, U the Europeans in general were more aggressive. Also, um, they, they seems their, their, their government had more centralized the power. Yeah. To, to facilitate uh, industrialization, right? Yeah. Like, and that's why the First World War, Second World War <laughs> took place among those yeah. European countries. Well, I, th I think, I mean, to me, the, the main thing that happened in the 19th century is that China missed the Industrial Revolution. Mm, that's a very interesting So, point. So okay. you had the Qing Dynasty run by the Manchus, uh, where, frankly, you have examples like Empress Shishi, mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. spent the treasury on mm -hmm. rebuilding the Summer Palace mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as opposed to the Navy, which mm -hmm. is what it was meant for. Yeah. So uh, I, I think the inward focus of the Manchus mm -hmm. under the Qing Dynasty mm -hmm. uh, led to a lack of interest in what was going on mm -hmm. in the rest mm -hmm. of the world yeah. and yeah. not any real intellectual curiosity. So right. when you had the Brits show up for the first right. time with, right. here are all of our discoveries and here's what's enabling us to modernize, right. the right. response from the right. empress or emperor at the time was very much, we have nothing to learn yeah. from the so West. I think that, so that time China really was not aware or know very little about what's going on in Europe. Exactly. Otherwise, you think they might have behaved differently. Oh, if they knew yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So if you think about Chinese history, 
If you miss the Industrial Revolution, which w was really affecting most of the advanced Western countries, and the US and the UK probably played a right. prominent role in, in a short Maybe that's also why you know, historians time. often talk about, uh, you know, Germany used to be a backward area or yes. nation, you know, was not even unified. And, uh, and until maybe late uh, second half of 19th century, then Germany start to emerge as a, yes. as a power. Yes. Uh, so how could Germany uh, do that, whereas other European nations like uh, Poland, I don't know, fail to achieve that? Yeah. And also in Asia, Japan, you know, came uh, into place. And uh, uh, but uh, people also talk about how come Japan succeeded in capturing the the process of industrialization, whereas China keep <laughs> falling behind. If you take those two examples, I mean, what was uh, the common denominator is both Germany and Japan uh, were very anxious to build up their industrial might for military reasons. Mm -hmm. So China, I mean, Japan was very aggressive militarily vis-a-vis right. -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis Russia uh, and other areas. So I think once you start down that track, then you want to be able to build ships, you want to be able to build an army, you want to be able to build everything that goes with military might. And yeah. Germany, exactly the same. Actually, Germany yes. was, a, you know, obviously a very major player in European wars in the late 19th century and then very aggressive and active in World War I and World War II. So I think a lot in those two cases, the industrialization followed a military spin. You know, war created a capitalism. So capitalism arise in Europe, not in Asia, because they had a constant state of wars. Mm -hmm. And those uh, uh, war created demand for different type of organization Mm -hmm. different type of financing and obviously uh, created the need to encourage commerce because mm -hmm. that gives you the money to, to finance wars. And therefore, so-called militaristic state way of industrialization actually came much earlier, like uh, starting from Renaissance. Those uh, Italian city-state, like uh, Venice, they were mm -hmm. essentially militaristic uh, state. On one hand, they need commerce. On one other hand, they need a strong army. Uh, military. So later on, uh, as a later co uh, uh, comer, like uh, Germany and Japan, they need to do more. Otherwise, uh, they would not be able to squeeze in to become a, a power. Yeah. So all the European powers, like, uh, like in France, you know, Louis the Fourteen and uh, other and the Laponia, and uh, they all, so all the European powers had this feature of uh, militaristic industrialization. So maybe that's another explanation for for China's failure. They never thought of or wanted to go that road. I think Qing Dynasty perhaps uh, has a, another reason because they are, as you mentioned, the minority to mm -hmm. control the ma major Han, Han people. You know, like uh, even like a city-state, like a Venice, if they want to rise up, they need uh, essentially everyone to be able to fight and everyone to be able to do business. Yeah. But if Qing Dynasty government, uh, the Chinese government do that, that means all the, f the financial resources and the military power will shift to, to the Han people. That will create a, a threat. So maybe that's an additional reason they didn't take that route. Yeah. Whereas for Japan, once they have the emperor, who is the, you know, the, god, the god of everyone, that seems that problem at least can be solved. I don't know. So that's a, one perspective. Yeah. Of, of course, the U.S. then become very different now because the U.S. does not did not rely on monarch, you know, they did not have any more kings, queens. But the U.S. later on also, like today, you look at the U.S. this military uh, com com uh, complex, industrial complex, mm -hmm. is something analogous to that uh, that kind of tradition. Yes, very strong in that. Yeah. So people, developing countries, think that. This seems to be one of the essential element for any country to become industrialized. You need that to create the huge incentive and the demand for heavy industries, yes. for lots yeah. of other things, and for technology adoption. And otherwise, you will be uh, uh, defeated. Yeah, be be killed. So that's yeah. that's one view. And uh, of course, the U.S. has a lot of different features, like they minimize the size of the government. But that's impossible for European. If you do that, perhaps you will be the next one to, 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 be, to yeah. be destroyed. Yeah. How do you think of this kind of perspective? This is essentially the view of uh, uh, Browdale, 
and and uh, Songbat, you know, the thing of war created capitalism. So people say why capitalism never arises in East, uh, in Asia. Uh, this provided one explanation. Of course, according to Max Weber, that he had a different view. His religion is different. Christian people, they are more industrious. They like to save. But that view seems also not very consistent with the history because the Jewish people also, you know, very industrious, very like to save. Uh, Chinese or the Buddhist people, perhaps they all they may be also good at doing. I don't know yeah. uh, those kind of things. But uh, they were not able to rise maybe because of the lack of a centralized militaristic yeah. industrialization motive, what you call like a national will. To use that will to mobilize resources, to organize the nation in a different way, to compete with the European nations. Yeah. But the U.S. was able to do that, uh, maybe not in the very beginning, but the U.S. know that, right? They know the European, how they behave. So the U.S. later on also built a military, also through the Civil War, that further enhanced the, the U.S. military capacity. So that, yeah. that could play a, a role. So China, when China became sort of kind of have a mindset where we do need a national army to be militarized, was during the Civil War and the war against Japan. Mm -hmm. So that helped the Chinese finally to, to be organized militarily mm -hmm. to fight. And with that military uh, fighting capacity that you enter the social planning era, but the social planning era, although you have a strong military kind of mindset, but you did not allow market to flourish. So you miss one part. And Deng Xiaoping solved that. He not only inherited this kind of, kind of military institutional capacity, but also allowed market. Whereas the Qin Dynasty had maybe just market, but no this kind of lack yeah. of this. I think there's, there's two fundamental differences between the US and, and Europe. Europeans have always been a very highly fragmented continent. Right, right. So you've got language differences, mm -hmm. you have cultural differences, you have religious differences, and you also have the fact that war in the 19th century was almost a constant state. Yeah. I mean, right up through World War I and then kicking in in World War II. So uh, I think that fragmentation, and even though they tried to solve it to some extent by creating the EU, there are still fairly significant differences mm -hmm. among the major countries. Yes. It was a huge advantage for mm. the US and China mm. to basically have a large, single language, integrated right. country. Right. Right. Um, and the US had the added advantage of while it was involved in wars, it was never on their own land. So one of the reasons, I think, for the economic success of the U.S. Is, is they were able to avoid war other than selectively joining, as they mm -hmm. did, obviously, in World War I and World War II. Right, right. And then China, the same thing. I mean, China, the challenge for many years was the internal fighting of yeah. the warlords and the Civil right. War. Uh, but once under Deng, China became very focused mm -hmm. on market-driven okay. economy yeah. and, and consumerism. Right. Uh, Deng just did an extraordinary job in a short right. period of time. So this is interesting. So, you know, East European countries also conducted market reform and their uh, economic foundation was much more superior. You know, they had a social plan era, but they built a lot of industries, including military industries. How come after introducing market reform, they could not perform as well as China. So you mentioned about Deng Xiaoping. So what's the major difference between Deng Xiaoping's leadership versus you know, the leadership in East European countries? Where did they go wrong, in a sense? You know, they, they, have, they had a much better foundation yeah. to the market reform. They did not go through cultural revolution. So what's your you know, view on this? Yeah. I think a huge advantage China has always had is just scale. Okay. So when, when you've got a consumer population today of a billion four, mm -hmm. um, e even when you look at the Asian tigers, so when you looked at Hong Kong and Singapore and Taiwan and Korea, they have not been able to create anywhere near the economic footprint that China has created, in part because of the, the scale of the country, okay. the population in okay. China. Yes, okay, so economy of scale is very important. That may also explain the U.S. success compared to European countries. The U.S. Mm -hmm. had much larger scale. Yes. Right? 
So even though German engineers, they may be very good, the Japanese may be very good, but your scale of the economy is very limited. Yes. Right. So on the other hand, um, there's also maybe some advantage for smaller uh, countries. For example, you know, you de- you need to develop an economy, you need a mass production, and you need a global market. But uh, the size of Singapore, because perhaps they only need a tiny bit of a global market that can support their industrialization. Yes. Whereas China needs the entire earth, and uh, the earth is very limited. So that may also make uh, smaller countries somehow easier on their way of yeah. industrialization in terms of cre- creating global market. Yeah. Uh, you know, I heard that uh, during Singapore's industrialization process in the 60s, uh, 50s, 70s, they had a huge sector of uh, manufacturing wax, but that market alone is able to support lots of people's employment. Uh, for China, you cannot just rely on that. Yeah. You need to rely on perhaps the other much larger market such as the textile. And but the textile market globally is very limited. The US give China some quota and say that's it. I heard from you know Taiwanese economists they say, you know, US give them a quota and soon the quota was filled. Then they have they have to search for alternative market. They say fortunately China opened their door for reform. So China become Taiwan's largest possible global market to yes. absorb their uh, industrial output. So then you look from that point of view, it's harder for China. Where's the global market? Now the U.S. is also trying to shrink China's global market. Mm-hmm. So that may, will make, a, you think that will make China's industrialization process harder to, to finish? Well, harder. First of all, I think the idea of containing China mm-hmm. is a ridiculous idea. Mm-hmm. Because if you look at the economic momentum of China, if you look at the cultural advantages, Chinese people just work harder than Americans. And there's no denying that. That's also the same view from the Europeans. They say Americans work much harder than the Europe, Europeans. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, look at European. I mean, the number of strikes um, and, and, uh, uh, and the number of holidays. I mean, when, yeah. when we McKinsey hire people from, right, right. in North America from France and from uh, Spain, I mean, they just are used to a model that is far less demanding. Mm-hmm. Whereas China is, is, again, dramatically harder worker. So having okay. worked at McKinsey and worked in many of our U.S. Okay. offices and then the same in China, it's very different. How, how different? Well, well, first of all, if you were to go to most Americans and say, mm-hmm. you're going to work six days a week, not five, mm-hmm. you're going to work from nine to nine, mm-hmm. uh, they'd say you're crazy. Okay. I mean, it, but that's just it, a, just, it would yeah. not be accepted that's socially. That's recent in the U.S., right? But in the, you go back to 19th century, perhaps the American, the average Americans work as hard as Chinese. They work for six mm. days, even seven days per, per day, perhaps. Yeah, may, maybe during times of challenge, like war times. Uh-huh. But um, I think, I mean, if I think about my father who grew up in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, his hours were not dissimilar from people working in the U.S. today. Okay, okay. When I would work with the, the Beijing or Shanghai office okay. at McKinsey, uh, you, you would just, if, if you watch, you would see the lights on very late at night, and then you'd see people falling asleep at their desk during okay. the day because they, they basically got no sleep. Maybe, maybe there's a pattern. Later comer, you have to work harder than the earlier ones. Yeah. So you, U.S. people, American people work harder than Europeans. The Chinese people have to work harder than the U.S. in order to come up. Otherwise, uh, it's impossible. So it's just like the Germany and the Japan, they need to be far more militaristic state. Otherwise, they could, there's no chance for them to rise up yeah. know, because the state was already fully occupied. Like uh, you know, uh, in academia, you know, in the U.S., it's so normal for all the professors uh, stay in their office until eight, nine, sometimes even midnight. But uh, I travel to Europe. It's impossible. If you do that, people, other people will look down at you. Why, why do you need to work so hard? Sure. So around five or four, everybody just lock other people's door and say, let's go home. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you, precisely, the U.S. is a latecomer in terms of industrialization. Maybe that explains why the U.S. behave differently. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, but China compared to the U.S. is much even later comer. That's maybe one, <laughs> one way to explain. But yeah. in the future, once China becomes rich, you will see Indians, uh, Indian people work much harder and the Chinese start to relax and they want to get off around four and they only want to work for you know, three or five days a week. Yeah, I would say the Chinese work much smarter than the Indians do. Uh, 
So I'll give you an I'm example. Not now. Yeah, yeah. I was living, I was visiting Delhi. I was, my family and I were going to go to Rajasthan mm -hmm. in the north. We were on this beautiful six lane highway okay. coming out of Delhi. Six lane highway. Six oh, that's lane. very good. Well, three each way. Okay. And, and, but it turned into a dirt road after about 50 miles. Oh, okay. All right. I said, well, what happened? Oh, the new mayor. Oh. doesn't support Rajasthan and doesn't uh, respect what they do. So he just stopped the road. Okay. So the amount of ira what I would call economic irrationality in India is huge. This is huge. So even though the people mm -hmm. are very smart mm -hmm. and they turn out more high-end students, which we saw at McKinsey yes. Than, yes. than almost any other country, yes. you do not have anything like the system in China mm -hmm. where you've got large numbers of highly educated people mm -hmm. advanced meritocratically mm -hmm. in the party, mm -hmm. and they're all on the same page. I mean, getting all Indians, I mean, just start with the Muslims and the, and the Hindus, um, they, are, they are not a united country. Right. I, I think the U.S. for 150 years has been the top economy in the world. Mm. I think one reason you see very little intellectual curiosity in the U.S., about what other countries are doing mm. uh, is because they've been so used to the idea that we're number one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One reason they push back against China's success mm -hmm. is because it's a dualistic mm. mindset with winners right. and losers. Right. So Americans genuinely believe mm. that if China is very successful, mm -hmm. they win and we lose. Yeah, that's, yeah. And, you, and you'd explain that to Chinese people and they say, no, no. Why do you look at it that? Why don't you right. just say, don't we want both sides to win? Right. If you just think about in our government and listening mm -hmm. to government people talk about China, mm -hmm. they know nothing about China. The really? They and, know and, nothing? And I talk, so, I, well, I talk, I seems, talk. Seems to, the, the, the Biden administration and the, even the Trump administration, they have lots of people, seems they know China very well, so well so that they can design good well, policy to contain China. Let's, let's just say they're very confident, I would say grossly overconfident in okay. what they know about China. Okay. I think if you ask them, what are, what, tell me about Confucianism. Mm. They say, oh, we know all about that. The Confucian Institutes mm. were put in the U.S. to spy. Mm -hmm. When you say, no, I'm talking about the Confucian values, mm. you wouldn't find more than 5% of Americans. Mm who could explain anything about Confucianism. Mm. I was at Peking University and they said, Pete, we had a delegation of 16 Congress people, all very focused on China in a negative way. Mm -hmm. Of the 16, one had been to China three times, mm. one had been to China once, 14 had never been to China. Who, who, who are they? I don't know. Okay, okay, just about but, a but, but still, right. it, it, yeah. it, it, it's, a ver it's a very small number. Right. And when you, when you listen to congressmen who generally are very aggressive about China and always explaining China and the way it works. So they'll frequently say, well, it's inevitable that China will become a democracy because the Chinese people are so unhappy. And you say, well, what evidence do you actually, they don't have any evidence mm -hmm. because they've never been. Mm -hmm. and, but, and how do you explain but, but the- But maybe, on the other hand, maybe natural because uh, you, um, I believe those congressmen, most of them have gone to Europe or even to Japan, but China just recently become developed, you know, sort yeah. of developing, developed. So therefore, they have not had the chance. Who, who want to go to a backward, <laughs> yeah. underdeveloped country, right? The, the incentive was not there. You go to you go to you know more developed or equal. When China just recently suddenly emerged, maybe they did not have the chance yet. I mean, I just see it as a level of overconfidence mm -hmm. based on 150 years of being number mm. one. 150 years, okay. Yes. And, and yeah, I mean, it goes back to literally the late 1800s when the yes. Industrial Revolution really gained steam. Mm -hmm. uh, and the U.S. talks about uh, the theft of intellectual property, like this is a unique thing. Mm. During the 19th century, the U.S. had a huge department in Washington whose only job was to steal intellectually property from the Brits. Yes, yes. So, so this has been going yeah. on for years. Yeah, and actually the same. Brits, they, uh, when during their time, you know, rise up, they, they spend a lot of energy stealing technology from Italy. Yeah. You know, and the Italy stole, stole technology from uh, Arabs. Yeah. So this this, yeah. this has been going on forever. Forever, that's right. Yeah. But later on, U.S. become an innovator. 
So and and since then they start to think you know yeah. we, have, we have always been innovator and we're number one. That's that's true. But yeah. it, it I mean China is innovative, but in a different way. China is much more application driven. So when the iPhone comes out, the, things like the iPhone and the internet and、mm-hmm. and what I would call the big economic ideas,、mm-hmm. they tend to come from America.、Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you look at The actual development of applications. Yeah, yeah. So if you take the iPhone and look at all the businesses、uh-huh. in China that、uh-huh. have been built around the iPhone,、uh-huh. it's pretty impressive、uh-huh. and huge. But it seems the same actually for the U.S. as you mentioned. In the 19th century, U.S. was a student of Europe. Yes. And all the technology they learn, they copied, even、yep. they stole. But you know, through that process, later on, you become on the top. Yeah. Maybe China was still in the stage of like early U.S. Yeah, mostly rely on learning and mimicking. Yeah, but、uh, later on, China will become you know an innovator on the top because you already start to see signs anywhere, right? Maybe that's a natural process for、yeah. India. Yeah, someday maybe the same. You know, India maybe nowadays or perhaps the next decades is still a very good student of learning,、yeah. copying. And、uh, but eventually they may become on the top, become a、uh, you know、uh, yeah. innovator in the frontier. I remember that、uh, in the 19th century U.S. If you if you search for a psychopedia, you search for a famous American scientist doing pure science, you find none, zero. But in the 19th century, by the end of 19th century, U.S. was already become a top in terms of industrialization, in terms of commerce,、mm-hmm. in terms of uh, uh, application. But、uh, zero in pure scientific research. But once enter the 20th century, entering the U.S. become on the top, and in the early stage, U.S. was actually rely on immigrants from Europe、yeah. because they have the two wars. Yeah. But later on, U.S. start to have its own very famous and very innovative、uh, scientists, more, 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 and Americans. Then later on, you no longer see European、yeah. na- names. Maybe that's that's just a natural process. So nowadays you still see China as、uh, you know very good at、uh, learning, mimicking. But you never know. I don't know. Maybe twenty years down the road, China may also start to have very innovative,、uh, not just the technology, but also in terms of、uh, basic research. Yeah. The government is now pumping money into、yeah. universities, and universities are reforming their way of educating people. So this、yeah. is maybe a natural pattern. Yeah. But it may not always be successful because many countries eventually could not move to the frontier.、Yeah. But in many ways, China is already there. I mean, if you look at Huawei, Huawei was the global leader in technology and telecom with 5G,、mm-hmm. and that was that was pretty impressive. And、yeah. if you look at what China has done in EVs, right,、uh, right. and what they did in high-speed rail, right,、uh, so there are a lot of areas where China has, I think, leapfrogged. The rest、right. of the world. Do you、already. think that the U.S. policy now actually is actually pushing or encouraging Chinese to do to become an innovator in chip yeah, industry? Yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, why would they have the incentive? It's much cheaper to buy U.S. chips and、yeah. high quality, low price. Yeah, you do on your own. It's very costly. And、yeah. now you say you do on your own. We won't sell to you. That、yeah. may actually well, push China to there. The the reason you do want to become re- reasonably independent is you can't count on globalization. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally think that the contain China movement history will look back on that as a very foolish idea, because what you're doing is you're really encouraging China to double down on its、mm-hmm. investment、Precisely. in the areas where U.S. has the strength. And if you push the ultimate globalization、yeah. or economic development, you, you're going to find that the Chinese. Once they get truly independent of the U.S., they have long memories. They're not going to go back to the U.S. and、right. say, "Well, okay, now let's be friends." <laughs> They're going to say, "You weren't there for <laughs> us,、no. and now we've matched you. We're going to go our own Actually, way," which they, would be a lose-lose.